Greetings, everyone. Welcome to our webinar on renewal at all levels. Uh, my name is Jim Fallows. I'm here under the auspices of the Our Town Civic Foundation, and I could not be more excited or delighted about the conversation we're about to have for the next, next hour with two people I respect greatly as leaders, both action leaders and thought leaders in this country, and also I'm glad to see say two people who are my friends. I'm referring, I'll refer to them by their first names as Josh Friday and Marie Slaughter. They will call me Jim and we'll all be uh, uh, comrades talking about what can be done at the local level, the statewide level, the national level, and the, the, the global level. Um, I'll say a word of introduction about each of our, our guests. Um, they come here with um, different kinds of extensive, extensive and perfect background for the kind of discussion we're going to have and with good, particularly good timing for our, our discussion. Um, Anne-Marie Slaughter, you know, as the CEO of New America. She's former director of policy planning at the State Department. I believe the first woman ever to hold that role. Dean of the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton, a best-selling author, a longtime personal friend of my wife Deb's and mine. And as of this week, the author of the brand new and highly rec recommended by me book, Renewal which is a fascinating personal, civic, national, historic, and future-oriented book, which we're going to hear more about. Joining Anne-Marie is Josh Friday, who is California's chief service officer, a members, uh, member of the governor's cabinet, I believe the first service officer to be in the cabinet in that role, head of the Innovative Cal Volunteers Program, an undergraduate and law school graduate of UC Berkeley, a U.S. Navy veteran as a JAG Corps member, a mayor of his hometown of Nevada, California, Novato, California, and now a leading proponent of new models of engagement and service, including the California Climate Action Corps. And I, as I said, I'm really glad that both of them I consider my good friends. We're here under the auspices of a number of organizations. I'll mention briefly the new Our Town Civic Foundation, which is designed to connect people around the country who are devoted to renewal the Jefferson Educational Society of Erie, Pennsylvania, which is host for the webinar itself, uh, the host institutions of our speakers, New America and Cal Volunteers, and many others, including our friends at the University of Redlands in my hometown in California, where some of California's first Climate Action Corps members were deployed one year ago. This is a timely moment for questions of renewal in some obvious ways, the overlapping emergencies confronting our community, communities, our states, the country, and the world, but also in particular ways for both of our panelists. For Anne Marie, as I said, it's publication week for her new book, and we're very fortunate to have her during her book tour. For Josh Friday, it is the one year anniversary of the Climate Action Corps in California, and he has a post today out on Medium about some of the lessons of, of its application. The title of that is California Demonstrates the Potential for National Climate Corps. And it is Climate Action Week too. So connecting both of you is the idea of renewal, what it means in practice, what it means in the theory, how its influence can be, um, can be, be uh, spread. And as I've read both of your works and thought about the things you're both doing, I've come to think of you both Despite your different backgrounds or different parts of the country, your different um, you know, fields of emphasis, as if you are complementary members of a choir or an orchestra, uh, helping us understand something better and appreciate better than we could, could on our own. So I'm going to, uh, as a housekeeping note, I'm going to leave the discussion between a Josh and Anne-Marie for a while, and my uh, friend and colleague Ben Spagan of the Jefferson Society in the Erie will be taking questions. You can submit questions to Ben as they occur to you via the Q&A function, and Ben will then feed them to me, and we'll get to them as we, we go along. Um, we will have a hard stop uh, less than one hour before our starting time. We could talk for many, many hours, but uh, that's, that's uh, what our conversation will be. So what I'd like to begin with both of you, starting with Anne-Marie on the occasion of your new book, is about the different kinds of leadership leadership and citizenship than the way each of you have been discussing, thinking about, and, and doing. And Anne-Marie, I was struck by uh, a quote right in the be beginning of your book. When you, you're talking about renewal at all levels, this is a very personal book about what renewal has meant in your own life, and it's also about the future of the country and the world. But uh, a quote that sticks with me is when you say, renewal starts with honesty, radical, honesty. Tell us 
what you think people should take from that statement, which is in a way the theme of your book, but tell us about radical honesty and what you would like us to know about it. Oh, thank you. So Jim, first of all, I'm always happy to be in conversation with you and with Josh uh, and particularly this week. And I just, for the, for our viewing public, <laughs> make it concrete. I have to at least hold it up. It's not very long. That's, a, um, but so Jim, your question is, is exactly the right place to start. Um, my concept of renewal itself is looking backward and forward at the same time. And the looking backward, whether it's as a person or as an organization or as a country, has to be done with radical honesty, by which I mean not flinching from our flaws. <laughs> and, and it's not natural <laughs> to, to, to just sort of take it in, not try to rationalize, not try to deny, actually uh, look at our flaws. And indeed, I even talk about running toward the criticism, actually finding out what people really think uh, and that that's the first step toward renewal. Because until you can see what's there, you can't change it. It's sort of the therapist mantra. You have to name it to change it. But neither can you then develop the muscles and the confidence uh, and really the hope to build something new because it will be on a false foundation. And just to give you, so my personal examples, I went through this professional crisis. And as you will remember, as a New America board member, one board member told me to run toward the criticism. I called every single board member and said, look, give it to me straight. Don't don't sugarcoat it, you know, don't be mean, preferably, but tell me what you think I'm doing well, but all above all, what I'm not doing well. Uh, and the same thing with the staff and the same thing with, with you know, I, other people who had watched me work. And then I had to really take that in and not only take it in at that moment, but look for whether there weren't patterns in earlier leadership positions. Uh, and that's what I mean by radical honesty. For people, it's our own flaws. For our country, I think we're in a period of radical honesty. When you have people like Clint Smith or uh, publishing, you know, how the word is passed, or Heather McGee with the Some of Us, they're saying, "Hey, here's the part of our history we don't tell, right? And that many of us, many white Americans, don't want to tell. Uh, but we have again radical honesty." So, Emery, thank you for that. I'm going to follow up with one just note, a, a disclosure note for the audience. Audience, in addition to being Anne Marie's longtime friend, we once lived in the same apartment building in Shanghai uh, a, a long, long ago. I am a, a new member of a board member of New America, and believe that Anne Marie was the object of grossly unfair criticism uh, when this this uh, controversy erupted a number of years ago. And, and Anne Marie talks about it with unsparing um, candor in, in, in her book. And so I was a supporter of yours then, then and now. Um, Josh, I'm gonna ask you that just as sort of a parallel theme about, um, but let's just get on the table. What is the big idea of what you're doing with, with the Climate Action Corps? And, and I'll try to knit these themes together, but Anne-Marie has told us sort of the, the big central idea of her book about radical, radical honesty. What's the big idea of what you're trying to do as California's chief service officer with the Climate Corps? Thank you, Jim. Uh, what an honor to be here with you and Anne Marie. And uh, that sounds like that would have been a really fun apartment building in Shanghai. <laughs> Wish I could have been there for that. Um, so thank you for this conversation. It, it is very timely. It's Climate Action Week here in California. We're celebrating the one year anniversary of, of launching the first ever statewide climate core. And the big idea and the reason that, that Governor Newsom has uh, appointed me to this position, has invested so many resources, is if we're really going to deal with the incredible division in our society, the incredible polarization, the isolation that all of us feel, and if we're actually gonna solve our problems and whether our problems are climate or poverty or homelessness, we actually have to both call on everyone to step up and contribute in a meaningful way. And then we actually have to create the opportunities for them to do so. And I think if we look back with, with radical honesty, as Anne-Marie so beautifully puts it, uh, on the last, I would say, 20 years, um, and, and we just all uh, commemorated the 20-year uh, anniversary of 9-11, 
I think many people in, in my generation, certainly, uh, but across the country, uh, look back with sadness that um, that after 9-11, when it was a time of, uh, could have been a time of great national unity, uh, many of us were asked to go shopping instead of serving. Uh, and we remember that. And now we have an opportunity, we think here in California, which is why we launched the Climate Corps, to actually empower people to be, to be part of the solution, to give them the opportunity uh, to work in their community, to do real things, to engage, to organize and connect with others. So we created the, the Climate Corps as a way of calling on all Californians to step up, uh, be part of the climate solution, and then actually give them something to do. And it starts with the fellows program, where we've had hundreds of fellows in the last year in, in communities across the state and very diverse communities, including San Jose and LA, but also places like Fresno, Stockton, and your beloved Redlands, of course, <laughs> uh, that, uh, that are actually working on the ground to organize volunteers, to educate individuals and neighbors about what they can do to take climate change. But the, but the essence and the big idea is it is time for us to empower everybody in our country to be part of the solution. It's not going to come from Washington. It's not going to come from Sacramento, from City Hall. We got to equip everyone with the ability to feel empowered. And that's what we're doing here in California with the, with the Climate Action Corps. And Josh, thank you for that. And there's a couple of the practical, practical implications I'm going to ask you about later. But I want to ask Anne-Marie about a theme of connection that is that runs through your book and also through what uh, Josh Friday was just saying. Something, I'll, I'll give you two precedents for this question uh, or, or uh, premises. One is you, your book is very much about connections. You start with your own personal reflections. You end with an agenda for the United States in the year 2026. And you're talking about global issues of inequality and opportunity and sustainability and, and all the rest. So the question of connection is fundamental to you. And also in our previous discussion, yours and mine and, and my wife Deb's, it's been part of, of the work that Deb and I did in our Our Towns project of trying to say at a moment of such national polarization, where are the sources of renewal and possibility and connection around the country? How a criticism I have heard of things I have written uh, in, 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 and done and Deb has done is that it's, um, it's too, separate separate to just look at things that are working well in some community without thinking about the morass of national or global politics what are ways you think people can you know in a, in your book you've made the connection between the personal the global and the national what are other ways you would encourage your readers and listeners and followers and admirers to connect what they are doing in their communities to the national and global level hmm. Well, I would start with the idea that connection is core, a core part of resilience. Right? So I talk in my book about resilience that until I really read and thought about it, I thought of resilience like endurance, like make like a rock and just get through the battering wind and rain. But that's not, that's endurance. Resilience is actually the ability to adapt, to withstand, yes, but to adapt and really to transform. And I write, I, one of the things I say in the book is that I discovered that resilience is a team sport, that it was only when I connected to my fellow leaders, to others in the organization, that I really wove the tissue of, of, of relationships uh, much more strongly, uh, that we were much more resilient than I, which is an obvious point, but not one we necessarily take on board. And when you think about climate and you think about resilience in the climate context, you start really with making connections within communities. And that's, some, you know, Jim, Our Towns, the book Our Towns and the Larger Project, you show that again and again. You show that because of a few people or because of a particular anchor institution, uh, there was a way of weaving together uh, the relate or, or just weaving relationships uh, in, in, you know, what has become a deeply fragmented society, a society we don't even know our neighbors, much less the people across town. Uh, so that's, the, I think, the starting point. And I don't think it should be diminished because those communities that have done that are communities that are renewing themselves. They are communities that are coming back, they're innovating, they're discovering new ways uh, 
to do things, but they, they're also renewing the spirit uh, of their towns. The, the broader piece though, I think is, is to think about the United States, and this is how I put it in the book, as both many and one, right? So often we think unity, we should all be connected. We should all be doing the same thing. But Josh, I'd, I'd love to hear about your climate core. My guess is that different people are doing different things in various communities and that you can pull that together, that collection of experiences without having to have them all connect to each other. Connection takes time and effort. <laughs> and, and if you're, you're connecting across your community, you probably don't have time to connect to 20 other communities, but that we can see that as a narrative of much greater unity uh, and even as we are, as I said, many and one at the same time. And the connections can be commitment to a higher ideal or commitment to the sense that finally we're fixing the country. And Josh, before you in inviting you to answer that excellent question, uh, let me just uh, use uh, one of Anne-Marie's mentions of local innovators as an occasion to note today uh, the death this week of one of the people who was a hero of our book, Our Towns, and also the movie, an artist named Charlie Jupiter Hamilton of Charleston, West Virginia, who actually narrates the final minute of the movie when in front of this mural he's painted in downtown Charleston, he's reading a passage from Julius Caesar about there is a, a, a on such a full tide. So I just wanted to uh, mention that in his honor that he died as after effects of Agent Orange, uh, years ago in, in, in Vietnam. He was a, a wonderful person who helped change the lives of everybody else in Charleston, West Virginia. Uh, but, but Josh, Anne-Marie posed an excellent question for you. The microphone is yours. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, thank you for, for honoring him and, uh, and for all your work to, to showcase uh, what is happening around the country and certainly in California around climate uh, where connection is the foundation of everything that we're doing. So I love Anne-Marie that, that that's what you talk about. Uh, it is absolutely fundamental. To, we, we are in a disconnected society. People feel isolated from each other. And, and this was before COVID. Uh, so much less dealing with, with the COVID reality. Uh, and so what we are trying to do and what, what we are building and what we have built over the last year is to create opportunities for people on big issues like climate uh, to actually work together, to come together, build those connections. And yes, it is, looks different in every community. What climate is, how climate is talked about, the work that we do around climate looks different in Fresno from LA. And what, what, one of the lessons you alluded to a, a medium post that we wrote about, one of the lessons we learned over the last year that we've shared and, and hope to continue to share with, with Congress and the Biden administration as, as this idea picks up momentum nationally in a very exciting way, is we have to build uh, programs like this and invest in programs like this that allow for local communities to define both what they think the problem is and then also what they think the solution is. And then we have to invest in the civic infrastructure, which does take an investment. And this is a, this is a lesson that we have to learn as a country. We can't just talk about this. We have to invest it. We have to put our money where our mouth is. Uh, and we have to build a civic infrastructure that actually allows people to come together. And that's something that I would argue we haven't done for generations in this country. And democracy, in my view, will not work and will not continue to sustain if we don't invest in the ability to make these connections at a very, very local level. Totally. So Anne-Marie, let me turn that to you. The ending of your book with your vision for 2026 is in a way as if what Josh is saying must happen actually happens or what the consequences if it doesn't. You are a veteran of international and national level politics. You're a keen observer of it. You're a historian. You've, uh, is it possible for the U.S. government at the national level, as we see it in circa 2021, to do some of the things that Josh has just talking, talked about and that you have uh, mentioned in your book? Well, you know, I, I lay out a vision and I do think we should use 2026, this, this hinge moment uh, of, of between 250 years, again, as a white majority nation versus 250 years as a plurality nation. I think we can do a lot. Uh, realistically, you've got, you know, a midterm election, a presidential election in 2026 will be a midterm election. 
we're going to have to change our political system pretty dramatically toward toward really being able to, you know, have open primaries, take the final five, four or five candidates and then have ranked choice voting, all of which we can do. And I think we could probably get to 10, maybe 20 states by 2026 that would have that. But I think a lot of the change I'm talking about is more likely to happen at the state level, the local level, uh, in some cases, the regional level. I, I think part of what we have to start with, though, and it sounds trite, but I really believe it, is just changing the narrative. You know, we, are, we reflexively say we're horribly divided, we can't do anything, we're paralyzed. Suppose we really woke up in the morning and said, you know, we are united in many ways, many more ways than we recognize. There are all sorts of places where Americans are in fact coming together and making change. We are in fact passing legislation, even in this Congress, we're passing legislation, the, stu the stuff that gets the attention, but other stuff. We are, and, and then start to point to it I think it would it would give us more agency and hope, right? This narrative of constant division just makes you feel like all you can do is wring your hands and wonder what happened to the country. So I, I do think, I don't think narrative is all we need by any means, but I think we need to start with a vision of a country that is not as divided as the polls and the media would tell us. And I'll say one last thing, if my colleague Lee Drutman, uh, at New America, just had this great piece in the New York Times where he said, what party are you? And you take a 20 question quiz and you come out as one of six parties. And his point is partly there's no middle ground. There, there are parties that are more you know, on the conservative side and three, three on the conservative side, three on the liberal side, but there's a lot of overlap. I mean, if you had those six parties represented, you'd have the possibility of all sorts of coalitions that you don't have now. So, you know, we're not, the Trump folks would be about 20%, the hardcore, mm -hmm. the absolute hardcore, 20%. That is not this deadlocked country uh, that, that everybody writes about. Yes, and a little factoid I'll introduce here is that the losing candidate in a presidential election has almost always gotten at least 40% of the vote. Barry Goldwater got 40%. Yep. Yep. Um, Herbert Hoover got 40% against FDR, et cetera. You know, there, there've always been blocks of people who have um, agreed and disagreed. Uh, Josh, let me turn Anne-Marie's question to you. You're part of the government in a state where more people live than any other state that is, produces more wealth than any other state and just went through a recall election about uh, ooh, that had a, a result that many of the national pundits did not, um, uh, forecast and where you have open primaries or, or you have, you know, the, um, the, the, well, I don't know what the technical term, but it's not, not the party primary. So what are the lessons from California about whether the narrative of functioning government can in fact be changed given all the problems California deals with? Yeah. Thank you for that question. Uh, I, I think last week's recall was sent a clear mandate and affirmation that uh, that we need to keep going bold and we need to keep going bigger and faster. And that's the lessons that, that Governor Newsom learned from, uh, from the recall last week. I think we hope that's a lesson that the rest of the country learned that, that, that government has uh, played a critical role uh, in the last two and a half years on big issues across the board, bold action on climate, uh, bold action with COVID, bold action uh, on healthcare and other important issues. Uh, and I think the people responded to that in the recall. And so we feel we feel very good moving forward. If anything, we feel a sense of urgency that we have uh, time is fleeting, that we got to move faster. We got to go bigger. Uh, and so uh, those of us who work for Governor Newsom feel that sense of urgency uh, in a very real way. But if I if I could also comment on one thing um, that I think Anne-Marie said so well, which is that this this narrative of division um, what it can do is, is create a sense of paralysis that, 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 uh, I, that, that these issues are too big, um, we're powerless, uh, that there's nothing I can do because we're so divided. And, and, and that's, that's the same thing we're fighting against when we, call, when we talk about the need to empower people and ask them to serve. It's this idea that uh, we have to move past the, the, the sense in our communities that uh, that 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 it, these issues are for someone else to solve, 
uh, or climate change is a global issue and it's too big for us to take on. Um, and we have to start saying to our people and changing the narrative in the way Anne-Marie is talking about to say, no, there's actually something that you can do. Here's what they are. And we're going to give you the tools and the ability to, to take action, but that but to send the very clear message that no, you have power. You are not powerless in this situation. Uh, and that is so important. That's a message that Governor Newsom talks about all the time. Uh, and that message was affirmed in last week's recall election. And Josh, if I could just follow up for a second, I have, was fascinated and actually wrote several months ago about the multi-tiered model you have in, in the Climate Action Corps of things. If people can commit a couple of years, great. They can commit a couple of hours, great. Can you just summarize briefly kind of the, the, the uh, various steps that you've made available to people to, to do something about climate? Yeah, so as you mentioned, in California, the, the most populous state in the union, 40 million people, and we're trying to figure out how to activate them to take action. Uh, we've set up a framework and an approach where we like to say, whether, whether you have a year to give or you have an hour to give, there's something for you to do and we need you to do it. And we've set up a fellowship where if you give uh, up to a year, you're going to receive a stipend to live and you're going to receive a scholarship of up to $10,000 to go to school or pay down debt. If you have a, a day to give, we're going to connect you to volunteer opportunities in your community that you can take with a climate organization or an environmental organization. And if you have an, only an hour to give, we're going to teach you how to plant a tree. We're going to show you how to, how to make your house more uh, energy efficient. We're going to empower you with the resources to actually have a, a meaningful impact on climate. And, and the message is clear to all 40 million people who call California home. There's something that you can do, and we need you to do it today. I love that. So, so Anne Marie, I have a different kind of question to ask you, unless you have sort of a, a, a that uh, various step model of action too. It's about your your copious work over the years about networks, about mm -hmm. the way networks work work within the community, within the country, or around the world. <clears throat> How we've been, <clears throat> excuse me, we're coming through a time when a lot of the, the odious effects of social networks are, are obvious to all of us. How should people think about the positive versus the negative potential of networks? And what are both the individual and sort of the policy ways that we can promote more of the positive networking effects uh, to deal with climate challenges and other ones and to reduce the, uh, the negative ones? Hmm. Wow. Yeah, networks are like technology, right? They are not inherently good or inherently bad. For, for every positive network I can point to, climate action networks of various kinds, I can point to Al Qaeda or you know drug trafficking or money laundering. All of those are criminal networks. Uh, you know, we call that racketeering in this country, but th those are the, you know they they are connected people and they they have hubs and uh, so. There's no magic in a network per se, but positive networks um, have a number of advantages. One, they're much more horizontal, right? This is not command and control, right? That's a hierarchy. The hierarchy, you have people at the top and they tell other people what to do. In networks, you have people at the center, you have a hub, although you can have a decentralized network and have multiple hubs. Uh, and those hubs, are also sort of centers of power, but they work by mobilizing, by connecting, by uh, act as sort of orchestrating action in, and catalyzing action in various ways by curating who, who's gonna be, who is gonna be part of the network and how is the network gonna be designed. And a well-designed and activated network has a number of properties, it, it allows for lots of diversity in the different hubs. Like if I, I'm sure I could map, Josh, your, your climate core as a network and I could show you, as you said, different cities would probably be different uh, hubs or maybe different, you know, different issues. Some folks are planting trees and some folks are, you know, strengthening uh, resilience against floods or whatever it might, might be. But there's a lot of opportunity for a sort of standard template, but lots of people to do it in a different way. And there is a, a way of really making people feel like they're part of something. And so Jim, to, you know, how do you do that? We have to invest in the connectors. I, I spend my life trying to convince foundations that 
simply connecting people in an email group or a, ch a chat or any of the ways we're connected won't do it, right? You need active network orchestrators or systems catalysts or, you know, collaboration managers. There are many names. And again, Jim, I'd point to your and Deb's work where you go into these towns and you find these people and some people do it like breathing, right? They just attract other people to them and they, they mobilize them. But often it really is a set of functions and it's work. It's real work. And part of what we have to do is recognize it, value it, in many cases, pay for it. But if we, if in some cases with volunteers, you may not pay for it, but you have to recognize that that is essential to making networks work, positive ones. So a, a housekeeping note before uh, turning that, that same question over to Josh. So a number of good questions are coming in via Q&A. So please feel free to keep them coming and I'll, I'll turn to those in a moment. Josh, my network question to you is there are different sort of uh, people of my generation, those who either served in the Peace Corps or served in Vietnam or were against the Vietnam War or in the civil rights movement, there are lasting network effects. People in your generation, there's a younger veterans bond that is very, very strong. And we see that you, you, you were part of that, that too. What kind of network are you trying to create with the Climate Corps and what have you seen so far in that potential? Yeah, I think I think we've seen something really powerful uh, in the same ways that that we've seen with uh, veteran generations of veterans uh, who go through an intense experience together, uh, thrown together uh, from very different parts of the country, very different perspectives, but are given the opportunity to have a common mission around a common purpose uh, and work together. And you walk away, and I can say this with personal experience, having served in the military, um, that stays with you forever. Uh, that bo the, both the bonds, the personal bonds you make, but also the belief that you can actually have something of, of similar uh, value with people that, that think differently than you. And to walk away with that understanding and that appreciation uh, stays with you forever. And some of the comments we've gotten from our young fellows uh, who have been involved in, in Climate Corps is that these connections are, are among the most important part of the program for them, uh, that they've now uh, feel connected to people from different parts of the state that they uh, they would have never come across and that they work together in a community that they cared about to deal with issues of uh, social justice around tree planting uh, and 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 many other issues um, and and that is that's a powerful powerful thing that we have to keep creating and investing in to Anne Marie's point one of the things um, that we're really focused on uh, in California is, not, it is not just in creating more service opportunities for people, which is important, and we have to do that, and we have to, we have to create uh, uh, avenues for people to engage, but we actually have to invest in making sure that those that do step up to volunteer, those that do step up to serve, walk away feeling connected to each other for, for, for life, and, and that takes additional investment. Uh, so we're, we're very focused on that. We also launched a, uh, we're a really uh, exciting part of, um, and one of the silver linings of COVID uh, was the ability to, to test some of these things in California. Uh, but to Anne-Marie's point of neighbors not knowing each other, we, we launched the first week of COVID, a neighbor to neighbor campaign to ask everyone in California. And we partnered with Nextdoor to reach literally millions of Californians uh, to call on Californians, uh, to check on a neighbor, to make sure that seniors had food, that they had groceries, that they had access to their drugs. Uh, and the program has taken off and we're gonna continue to invest in it uh, and to build the local leaders who can lead neighborhood programs uh, and to ask neighbors to help each other. So really important part of the work. Uh, and it's something that, that we're gonna continue to invest in in a big way. And there's a question that's come in about a related issue, which I'll get to in a second. I would just want to have, I guess, one more question from me to, to both of you. Um, so Anne-Marie, a generation even older than I am of my parents and, and, uh, and their uncles, whatever, the, one of the bright sides of the horrors of the Depression in the 1930s was the Civilian, Civilian Conservation Corps and the ways in which it rebuilt infrastructure and built bonds among people who wouldn't otherwise have, have, have been together. Um, I've written about Josh's program as being a potential model, you know, the California statewide model uh, nationally. What is the potential 
for having this kind of model get any kind of nationwide traction? Are there ways do you think the U.S. could use its infrastructure program to to actually put money into the network building and service of the kind that California is showing us? Yeah, uh, that that would. Uh... I, I do think so. I, I just have to say, though, for a second, in terms of, of investment, one of the ways you can think about this is, is universities. So I'm sitting in Princeton. Princeton has the most devoted alumni anywhere because it isn't just your current network. It's your alumni network. I was thinking about that when you're talking about vets, right? You know, Princeton has a whole building of people dedicated to maintaining ties with between among alumni, right, through reunions and, but not, but also, you know, ongoing education and trips. So just to point out again, what kind of work it takes not only to forge those ties, but then to, to facilitate their, their deepening and their, and their preservation. I, you know, again, Jim, I think we're most likely to see replication at the state level before we go national. Mm -hmm. And there's some kind of critical mass there. I mean, actually, with Obamacare, Massachusetts offered universal care, and that went pretty much directly uh, to be the basis for parts of Obamacare. But in many cases, what you have are, are states copying one another. And then when you get to a certain number, there's a sort of I mean, if it's regulation, for instance, business starts to say, for God's sake, I don't want this patchwork of regulation, let's go national. But I think in other ways, uh, what you could see now would be a framework, uh, Jim, as you suggest. So you've got this infrastructure money. The infrastructure money could be tied to say, you know, if you create state core and climate is great, again, care core, they're the same idea of taking care of co neighbors through mutual aid societies, which have sprung up all over the place. You can imagine those people as community health workers, community care workers, right? So they're not, they don't have medical training, but they are there to get the groceries to, to facilitate in so many ways. Uh, and there you could again allow for local and state experimentation. Uh, and you know, you can build the hard infrastructure, just like the Conservation Corps. But Jim, as you know, I believe that an infrastructure of care is every bit as yep. important as an infrastructure of roads and bridges and, and uh, uh, ports. And frankly, broadband, the access to yes. broadband is equally important. So you could have various core, just as in the military, yep. uh, performing various functions, but at this sort of volunteer or, or you know, paid enough to live wage, but, but not, not a full job. So, so Josh, just quickly before I turn to these, uh, a, lot, a lot of fascinating questions. Is there any traction in having the California model go national that you've seen? We've seen some really exciting traction, Jim. Uh, we've seen President Biden talk about this. In fact, he just talked about it recently with Governor Newsom at a summit a few weeks ago about uh, the, the California model and how excited the president is to see this nationally. We've seen uh, members of Congress from AOC to Chuck Schumer, uh, to many others talk about this in Congress and have introduced legislation and it's moving through now, uh, hopefully tied to the, the infrastructure bill. So we, we've seen a lot of interest uh, in, in, in this type of model of creating a national civilian uh, climate core. And I think what it demonstrates is um, the realization from elected officials, finally, that people want to be asked to be part of the solution. People mm -hmm. want to contribute. People want to be involved and people want to feel like what they can, what, what, uh, what that their time is is valuable, and that they can do something for their community. And and as so for to have elected officials from President Biden and members of Congress uh, start to talk about creating this type of model nationwide uh, that actually empowers people to be part of the climate solution. Uh, and we know the younger generation, especially, is so passionate. Uh, in such a needed and important way about this issue to us is very encouraging. Um, and again, it's gonna show that California is just gonna keep leaning in and going bigger and bolder with our ideas. Helps having a vice president from California. <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate her very much. <laughs> so here's a question for both of you. And lots of questions have come in about leadership, about inclusivity, about equity. Question, I'll start with Anne-Marie. How do you remain an honest and transparent leader in the field of public service or public affairs 
when there are more questions than answers, when people are relying on you to find solutions and mass, massive issues? How, so that, that's the question. I'll start with you, Anne-Marie. That's a very good question. And I fielded something similar a day or two ago where I do think uh, for public figures, you have to be savvy about where you're engaged in radical honesty. I mean, we are in this world of social media, we're in this world of sound bites. I mean, it just drives you crazy. But to, and Jim is a former speech writer, you know, today you have to craft the speech so that the the the, the great line can't be immediately, you know, edited into a sound bite and taken out of context. Yeah. So I, 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 I'm not advocating that public leaders, particularly public officials, just start listing all their faults. I think that's something they, they do need to do. I think, again, we all need to do it, but you don't have to do it in public. Uh, on the other hand, I think we are in an age where honesty can be rewarded more. I think you're seeing that with younger leaders, the younger generation, you're seeing a whole new generation of people going into politics and just saying, this is who I am and I'm not gonna be airbrushed. Uh, lots of women going in who, and, and you saw that actually uh, in the 2020 elections where you had new folks coming who just said, this is who I am. So, I, I, and part of that I think is acknowledging unbelievable uncertainty. I mean, the idea that you have the answers to problems of staggering complexity, it's not credible. And one of the things I write about in Renewal is how I move from being a sort of a single individual leader to being much more of a collective leader where I have a team, I, have, I split my job, I'm CEO, I have a president, we're, you know, we talk all the time. I have four other sort of vice presidents who are kind of a, a, my, my core group, and then another circle, a larger circle around that. Uh, and I think you can say it's going to take many minds and many cross-cutting expertises because these problems are so complex and so big. I think the public will understand that. Uh, Josh, you're a public official now. How do you <laughs> deal with these issues? Yeah, I mean, three words that uh, that my team hears a lot are, I don't know. Uh, and I think that it's okay. Luckily, I have an incredible team. Uh, so they have the answers for most of the time. Um, and but I think being honest that we can't we don't have all the answers. Uh, and I also think uh, starting with one, our own teams, but then this is the message that we're sending to all of California uh, is we are going to succeed and fit fa or fail as a team. That's just the truth. That's what we've got taught in the military. You live or die as a unit. We are going to succeed or fail as a team. And that's the message that we carry, not just internally, but externally to all of California, which is if we're going to succeed in, in protecting our communities from fire, from drought, from historic heat waves, we're going to have to do that together. All of us, all 40 million of us. If we're gonna succeed in overcoming inequality and racism and sexism uh, and, and all the other injustices in our society, that's gonna to be together, but we have to model that as leaders. Uh, and it starts with our teams and it starts with sending that message to our teams. And then hopefully that reverberates uh, to the rest of our community. And that message is very much in sync with what Anne-Marie writes in, in, in Renewal. Um, here's another related question. Again, I'll start with, with you, Anne-Marie. It says, question, a Berkeley professor said that progressives have not done a good job of defining and um, stating what, what, what we're doing, while the conservatives have created good slogans and, um, and mantras that, that um, work great. An example would be the term climate change. Is this the best way to state that we need to clean up the earth, our, our home place? This is part of the, you know, connected to your previous point about changing the narrative. Uh, how can the sort of uh, imagery gap between uh, parties to political discourse be um, reduced? I love the, you know, cleaning up our home, taking yeah. care of our home. Uh, and indeed, some of the climate work, uh, you know, in the evangelical community absolutely mm -hmm. talks about God's earth, right? Our, sort of our duty uh, to, to preserve it. Uh, so I, I do, uh, I agree, actually, that, that I think um, in acknowledging the complexity, uh, you, you, 
you shouldn't be giving up the kinds of slogans. And, and again, I believe deeply in words and the power of words. Uh, it's not enough, but it's, I think it's, it's necessary, but not sufficient. Um, I think there are, so the way I would answer that question is I actually think the left needs to own a, a, a new patriotism, a critical patriotism, yeah. right? James Baldwin said, I love yeah. my country so much that I reserve the right to criticize her perpetually. And Carl Schurz, who was a union general and a senator uh, from Missouri said, you know, my country right or wrong, when right to be kept right and when wrong to be set right. And I actually think we should be embracing a lot of the kind, the words, the slogans in, in the Declaration of Independence, right? You know, these truths, equality, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, the Gettysburg Address, the Pledge of Allegiance, and talking about how we're not living up to those and what would it take to make them true, right? This is what holds us together. This is how we were founded. Yes. Those founders were deeply hypocritical. That's part of the complexity. You don't, there is no one beautiful Manichaean, you know, dichotomy, uh, which is not words I'd use on the stump either. But <laughs> <laughs> it's, but, but, but those words have inspired change makers and reformers for generations. Mm -hmm. And what does it take to make them true today? What does it take to make this, to make, this country still, you know, the land of the, the, the oh, beautiful for spacious skies, right? There's a lot to draw on. And I think the left is often uncomfortable with that language, which then hands it to the right. And that's ridiculous. You know, we can all be patriots in, in our different ways. So Josh, before asking you about the rhetoric of climate change and, and, and imagery, I'll just say that, um, Anne-Marie, your point about the power of words limited but profound is one that, that resonates with me. As I happen to remember in 1977, Jimmy Carter gave a commencement address at Notre Dame, essentially on exactly this point, huh. that we don't think that words alone will change everything, but our own history opens our eyes to the power of words from Thomas Paine to Martin Luther King, et cetera. So yes, this is a, I, I am glad to hear you emphasizing this crucial point. Um, Josh, how do you think about imagery and words in your work? Yeah, really important question. It, it's part of what we uh, we were talking about earlier about how, we, and this is one of the lessons we hope that that the uh, national government takes in setting up a national climate corps. Um, we have to be very sensitive uh, and supportive of local goals and local communities, and and understand that uh, for LA, it's about uh, uh, social justice and planting trees in communities who have been discriminated against for decades. Um, with uh, policies that have left no tree canopy uh, and makes the communities much hotter than, than wealthier parts of the, the community. Uh, but, and that's because of climate change. And in places like Fresno, it's about beautification and pride in your community. And it's not about climate. It's not about the planet or, uh, or, or the green earth. It's about beautifying your, your street. Uh, and so giving, creating the flexibility, I think, uh, to say we're going to invest in the resources for uh, for each community to, to define their what their goals are, uh, define the problem, the goals, and then how to uh, tackle it, we think is is really important uh, and is part of what we're doing. And Josh, to follow up with you, you've you've begun to answer the theme of a number of questions that have come in. Let me just read excerpts from a couple of them and have you and Anne Marie respond. One is question: How do we continue to make volunteerism attractive to underprivileged individuals without access to many basic needs? Many of these people are already, already engaged in unofficial volunteerism, church services, caring for youth in the neighborhood. Another one says, Josh Friday, can you bring your program to my low income community? Many people in the LA suburbs live below the poverty line and those have to wait to work two or three jobs just to pay rent. Leisure or volunteering is non-existent here. So you've begun to talk about that, but say more in response to those questions. Yeah, well, first of all, our hope in California is to bring these programs everywhere. Uh, so that's that's part of our goal. So yes, we, we hope to come to your community. Uh, but it's a really good question um, about how we talk about volunteerism and service. And I think it starts with uh, with leaders. When we, call, when we say we can, we're calling on people to be part of the solution, we're calling you to take climate action, or we're calling you to help uh, with homelessness or to check on a neighbor. Uh, it's it's to we have to point out and identify that literally everyone can do something that matters and and, and that's 
I think that's also um, uh, a, an understanding and shows appreciation that everyone's experience has value. That we, we launched a really incredible, to give an example, program uh, that I'm very proud of called the Justice Corps that takes formerly incarcerated young people uh, and gives them a stipend and a scholarship for college to then help other people who are transitioning out of the judicial system navigate. And, and to me, what that is, is that, that, that is us saying to those to formerly incarcerated young people, your experience matters. Your experience has real value to the state of California and to our communities because you are going to be able to help other people transition. And to, to every Californian uh, who, again, who has an hour or a year, um, you can do something that matters to the community, that, that can contribute in a serious, meaningful way. Uh, and so that's the message that we're trying to get out. Now, that does take a lot of investment into thinking about how do we make our service programs more equitable? How do we pay more? It's something we talk about a lot. We have to pay our service members more. Um, we have to create incentives for people to be able to, uh, to, be able to give back. I was lucky enough uh, when I came um, home from the military to, to buy a home because I had access to the VA loan. So that was our country saying, we're going to appreciate your service and we're going to create uh, economic incentives. We have to do the same for volunteering uh, and for service because it's that critical for our democracy to be strong and for us to continue to prosper. Um, Anne-Marie, I know you write about this theme a lot in Renewal. Uh, tell us how you would respond to these questions. You know, I was I was thinking about uh, the point that many people are already yeah. doing what we would call service. So absolutely, you know, the the people who are taking in the children, often of relatives who are either incarcerated or unfit in some way. I mean, you know, we've got grandmothers raising kids around the country. And I honestly, and Jim, your grandfather, I, I'm not, I've, my kids are in their 20s, but I, you know, the idea right now of having a toddler and you know, it's one thing if you, you hand them back to your parents, but so there, there are a lot of people who are again, giving care or otherwise taking care of people in their neighborhood, in their community, in their families that we don't, that is a form of service, right? That is essentially investing time yeah. in the next generation of our country or indeed easing the current gener, you know, the older generation toward the end of their lives uh, and helping re repay. So I do think part of that answer is giving us an understanding that you can serve in many ways. It doesn't have to necessarily mean, you know, volunteering at a local charity. Uh, there are other ways that you can do it and that we can, we can get other people to help you to begin with, but also to value that. So Anne-Marie, here's a follow-up question that comes directly for you. And it's by the same person who asked a question for jo to Josh Friday of how to get you to come to my low income community. You'll see why I'm asking it. Question for Anne-Marie Slaughter. Um, how can we get you to be known in low income communities of color? In all honesty, you're a model citizen. However, many young women in my community look elsewhere for inspiration, do not focus or concentrate on education. What can you say or do to motivate and guide these young students to follow in your uh, footsteps and lead and educate and make positive change? Generational questions here, equity questions. If you are an example to the next generations, um, what do you tell them? Well, in so in my book, actually, I talk a lot about engaging with younger women. I tell the story of giving a commencement address at Barnard uh, with a you know very diverse student body, and actually the student body had demonstrated that they didn't want me as their commencement speaker. They wanted Chima Mande Adiche Negotse Adiche, the Nigerian American novelist, which I get. She's a fantastic novelist, and I talk about how I really misread my audience, and I and and that th that I didn't listen in that context. I didn't understand. I, I was talking about a woman president. I was supporting Hillary. They all wanted Bernie, right? I wanted the woman president. They wanted social justice. Uh, and so part of my answer to your question, and I do try to address it in, the, in this book, is that, you know, as a, a feminist, a woman who has mentored countless other women, I have not or had not fully taken on board 
the way the younger younger women are thinking, where you know the color, gender, gender, sexual orientation, all, intersectionality is their rallying cry, uh, and a sense that wait a minute, they went, might well look at me and say, "What do you have to say to me? Your experience is so different." And to that, all I can offer is again real honesty that says, "You know, you're right. I've learned a lot." Uh, talking to, to all of you. I do think I know some things that will help you get ahead in the world and maybe you want to listen to me too. But to start, to start that com conversation on the grounds of what I call confident humility, right? So that I'm confident that I have something to offer, but I'm really humble about what I don't know. Uh, and I do think we need many more of those conversations, woman to woman um, and man to man. So we're nearing uh, the end here. I'm going to just I'm going to ask each of you a wrap up question just just for a minute or so. So, um, Josh Friday, during this Climate Action Week and the one year anniversary of your Climate Corps, what is the main message of either motivation or hope you would want people listening to this discussion to take about the possibilities for renewal, including crucially climate? Yeah. And, and the, the, the theme and the focus on renewal is so important. So it's been such an honor to be with Anne-Marie and her, to celebrate her new book uh, and to talk about it and learn about it. Uh, Cause we think about renewal a lot. It's individual renewal, renewal of hope, renewal of purpose and efficacy that we can actually make a difference in our communities. Um, that's something that, that, is, that is central to the idea of the California Climate Action Corps and all the service programs that we're promoting we think about communal renewal. How do we renew communities and create the kind of connections that we talked about earlier between people of very different backgrounds who may think differently or come from different areas, but understand that they're part of building something together. Uh, and we think about civic renewal, that we can, that we can build trust in each other uh, first and foremost, it's the, the, what, one of the lessons of uh, being a veteran that you learn the ability to, to trust other people uh, when, you're in, when you have a common experience and a common purpose, uh, but also um, the idea that uh, we can trust in our ability to come together and solve problems. And so my final message uh, to Californians and to our country is we can solve climate change. We can protect our people, we can protect our communities, we can protect our kids and our grandkids, and we can do it together by building community. And that's what we're doing with the California Climate Action Corps. So join us, uh, go to climateactioncorps.ca.gov. Sorry, James, thank you for that, that letting me do that shameless plug. Uh, but um, you can be part of something, you can be part of building a community, and you can be part of helping us solve this really existential threat. Thank you. I'm, I'm ready. I'm, I'm going to, my son's <laughs> in LA. I think I'm going to tell him to sign up. <laughs> so, so you started with radical honesty. Anne Marie, how do you, uh, how do you see us out here? I see us out on, again, the value exactly part of what Josh said, which is connecting to something bigger than ourselves. You know, I write about, I, I talk about how renewal is very prominent in many spiritual traditions. Uh, and, you know, the, the renewing the covenant uh, in, in the Bible, but also in the Jewish tradition. Uh, and, and Buddhism has, a, you know, the whole idea of kind of constantly being, being renewed. Uh, and that's part of that, I think, is this sort of call to our best selves as individuals, as communities, as organizations, as, as a nation, indeed the world, and the value of believing in this bigger vision. So, you know, the book ends, yes, on a, you know, some people would say insanely positive note, you know, have I read the news? Yes, I've read the news, <laughs> but I screen out a lot of the news because I need to keep the faith that I can in fact make a difference. And I do that by having a vision of what this country could be uh, and inviting others to say, hey, this is my vision. What's your vision? Josh has just given his, and I find it deeply compelling. But the point is, again, to bring people together because it needs to be a common vision. This is not just a better me. This is a better we, and it's the creation of a we. Uh, and I honestly, I believe in this country as, as much as I face our, our sins, our crimes, 
Uh, I believe that we are, I believe in our diversity. You know, my vision is a country that could reflects the whole world, not just Europe, the whole world, and can connect the world and can move from, you know, being a global policeman to a global problem solver and climate issues, planetary issues, right? Let's, let's preserve the planet uh, are a big part of that. So I would end by, by saying, you know, it's important to have a vision to have for that sense of meaning and purpose. And it's critical to connect to others in the service of it. For those wise words, thank you, Anne-Marie Slaughter with your new book, Renewal. Thank you, Josh Friday with the one year anniversary of the California Climate Corps. Um, thanks to backstage to Ben Spagan, who's been running this. Thanks to all of you who've joined in. Thanks to the participating organizations, the R-Town Civic Foundation, the Jefferson Educational Society, New America, Cal Volunteers, um, University of Redlands, and anyone else who has joined us. Um, this, we've recorded the session, it will be available online. We'll spread the word. Thank you all and let us renew our country and the world. Goodbye. Thank you, Jim. That's really an honor. Really Thank great.